Hey, everybody, and welcome to a brand new episode of That Tom Clancy Show. It is me, your humble host, the the robot who's a go-bot. No, I'm not a go-bot. I was, a, I was an Autobots and Transformers kid. But it's so lovely to see all of you here tonight. I am, of course, your host, Mr. That Tom Clancy. Uh, some of you eagle-eyed viewers might be wondering why there's a rubber duck on my desk. It's simple. I'm just going back to an old college tradition I never actually got to take part in. Um, I don't know what his name is right now. I don't think he has a name. But hey, chat, maybe we can come up with a name for our duck. Well, it's been a crazy day. Uh, it has thunderstormed like five times here. And I think I'm in between the worst of it right now. So we should be able to get a show going today. Uh, now, my guest today is uh, talking to us from the future in the far off land of Australia. He's also happens to be the co-founder and game director of a veritable all-star team of game development talent. Bits and Pixels, please welcome Craig Ritchie. Hi, Craig. Hey, hello. How are you? Yeah, good, good. How are you doing? Uh, you know, melting a little bit. It's been a very warm summer here. Oh, Sunday, Sunday 87. Thank you for the follow. Uh, also, Badastro69 and XB White. Thank you all for the follows today. Um, but welcome to my humble garage, which I, I decorated for, for you today. It looks beautiful. Well, thank you. Uh, I also, I got you a cup of coffee. I understand it might be a little difficult to get. Um, but I do have to ask because you are effectively in the future. Do you have any hints on lottery numbers that might be successful for those of us still in your yesterday? Well, I've got more than hints, but if I share them with you, I'd have to share the winnings too. So that's a no. <sighs> Sorry guys. I tried. Well, uh, you know, lottery sadness aside, uh, we are here to talk about a lovely game, which I just heard of last week called Broken Roads, uh, which you and your team submitted as part of, uh, now last month's, uh, hashtag pitch your game event. Yeah. So I'm going to come straight out and say this. I think your game looks really cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I ran a little impromptu stream last week where I uh, pulled out the games that kind of stood out to me uh, specifically, and Broken Roads was one of them. It's uh, felt very uh, Fallout back. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's that's a pretty accurate take on it. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, but with a party, and that seemed nice. So, uh, in your own words. Uh, for people out there who might not know, uh, what is Broken Roads? So Broken Roads is a, you know, it's an isometric RPG, very traditional style set in a post-apocalyptic future Australia. Um, we haven't just gone post-nuclear, you know, there's a lot more going on in that world. Um, it's a party-based game, like you mentioned. We're planning for up to five companions, so a party of six, you know, as with everything, there's disclaimers, and we may balance test and go, you know, this works better with a party of four or a party of five. Um, and on top of being, you know, harkening back to a lot of the traditional RPG mechanics that, you know, we know and love that I grew up on, that I know a lot of gamers out there have enjoyed from, say, the original Fallout and Baldur's Gate through to more recent things like Pillars of Eternity and, and Wasteland, uh, we've got a lot of those same underpinning mechanics and introducing a couple of new ones. Uh, that we're very proud of i think most notably is the you know the moral compass and how that's playing into um you know various aspects of the game design nice well you also uh yeah you, you gave me a trailer to show everybody would you mind if i showed that off absolutely go for it all right guys i've got a bit of a trailer for you it's gonna start right now
And welcome back from the trailer, everybody. I really hope that the audio was working on that because otherwise I'm going to look like one dumb CRT robot. <laughs> well, I didn't hear any audio and uh, Sunday Sunday is our audio lead and composer. So I think you can expect him trolling very soon. Okay. Why you got to do that to me Sunday, Sunday? <laughs> uh, indie Game Lover and Liam, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Liam is, of course, the, the founder of Hashtag Pitch a Game. Yes, they hey, heard thanks audio. Thanks for showing up. Yeah, Liam tries to be here for every episode, which I find to be uh, slightly mad as <laughs> it is uh, like 2 a.m. his time right now. But apparently, Liam doesn't sleep. So Yeah, I got a message from him, and I think he said that he is pretty much nocturnal anyway. So I've gotten mails from him at, at hours that would be, you know, would surprise me that most people in, in Europe are online. You know, so hey, Liam, and thanks for joining. Yeah, I, I, frequently I don't think about what time it is when I uh, send people random messages. I just kind of do it when the thought occurs to me. And then I think, oh, crap, they're sleeping. I'll hear back from them, you know, tomorrow. Liam? No, five minutes later, that sounds like a great idea, Tom. Let's do it. And I'm like, dude, go to sleep. But, hey, you know, it's your neurochemistry. You play with it. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it is a very striking game. Uh, you got this you. very kind of like painterly style with a little bit of like that old kind of classic comic book look with those harsh black outlines. Mm. And dig it if you couldn't yeah, tell from you. my slight outlines but <laughs> yeah no thanks that that's something that i knew sort of quite early on we did play around with um what style we're going to go for i looked at some pixel art solutions uh, none of which really matched what we were trying to achieve with a level of quality that would have been anywhere within within budget um full 3d also wasn't going to capture what we wanted you know i I've always thought that a lot of the time the concept art looks better than what, what actually ends up in the game. Uh, and people are doing amazing things with 3D and VFX, don't get me wrong, but I felt like for this, I wanted that concept art look to the environments. I wanted that big brush stroke, painterly feel, like you say. Um, and so, yeah, I looked around an art station, found somebody who's, whose style totally matched what we were going for, and it's been a, you know, an absolutely fantastic fit. Um, there's hardly a you know a, a journalist or a community member, or somebody that maybe comes up to us on uh, at a live event and doesn't comment on you know we think your art style is beautiful, is your art style that um, attracted me to the booth or something like that. So yeah, we we're very very proud of it. And I'm incredibly proud of um, Kirsten Evans. You should look her up on Art Station and how she's managed to to direct the look and feel to the game to be completely in line with our, our visual target. I may have done just that. Awesome. Uh, before the show and uh, Phoenix 44. Thank you for the follow. Um, yeah, she has some excellent work on her art station. Absolutely. Uh, as like she did the, the uh, Jabba's hanger set that she did. Cause I'm, I'm a big star Wars nerd. So, you know, mm. anybody who's going to throw some star Wars uh, work up there. Yeah. I'm all over. Yeah, she did a, a brilliant study, and that definitely factored in when I <laughs> when I was assessing her work. I was like, "That's that's awesome." Yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned uh, you know this going for this different style of apocalypse and being very much set in Australia. Uh, would you say that one of the uh, uh, inspirations for your, this would be a a niche little known kind of a cult classic definitely not some big huge movie that just came out a few years ago uh would you say mad max served as some level of inspiration for this mad what uh, i think it's mad max max never never heard of it and oh. any similarities are purely coincidental <laughs> no no and obviously there's you know this is the root of it all really you know um mad max did so much for defining um, post a puck, you know, absolutely. And the fact it was set in Australia is, is you know, just, just a, a bone Australia for us. Um, I mean, you, you look at so much of the content of the early and, and, you know, more recent fallout games as well, right down to like spiked shoulder pads and that sort of glam rock early eighties style that came into, to Mad Max the influences is, is just, uh, undeniable, you know? So no, totally. They, they've done so much. Now, of course you want to, 
distinguish yourselves. You know, you can maybe find somewhere between the first movie and the all out craziness of Fury Road or even parts of Beyond Thunderdome. Um, and we, we've tried to settle ourselves. Like if you, if you are a fan of Mad Max, you know, the movies, well, we're a little bit further gone than the first movie, but we, we're definitely not as far like society hasn't crumbled quite as far as, as Mad Max two, or at least not all areas of, of our wasteland, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a super interesting time that, that the Mad Max films, you know, we could get a, uh, I'm not sure about this Furiosa movie that's that's apparently in the works now, exactly when that's set. But I think a really interesting time is showing how they went from Mad Max, which happened to be filmed about 30 minutes away from the studio, by the way, nice. um, and, and the time of the second movie, that sort of final collapse of organized society. And that's that's kind of where Broken Roads is located. I will say that when I, because I've only seen uh, the original Mad Max and Fury Road. And mm. when people told me that Mad Max was a post-apocalyptic movie, I was looking at this and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't think you understand what post-apocalypse is. <laughs> I mean, like this just seems to me like an Australian Western with motorcycles. <laughs> You know, it's definitely part of that. You can see the, you know, if you watch the second and the third, you know, you see how it goes to um, all the way through to Fury Road. There is a, uh, you know, there's a path, there's a track that you can follow there, you know. That said, Fury Road was spectacular. Amazing. One of the greatest movies ever made. Unreal. Yeah. One of the crazy things to me, and I, you know, I, I'm glad I told you beforehand that tangents happen on this show, is that the movie didn't have a traditional script. It was mm. literally just a storyboard. Mm. Like mm. that was how uh, George Miller pitched it to Warner Brothers. Yeah, and amazingly executed as well. And it works so well. And if you've seen the, there's a black and white one and a silent version, just fan edits that were put online. Have you seen those? No. Yeah, so give check that out and you'll see how absolutely brilliantly that film works without color and without sound. It's quite amazing. I'm imagining that in my head in the black and white version is astounding. Mm. So, all right. So uh, uh, back to your post-apocalypse. Um, I know you're going to be kind of tight-lipped on story stuff, but I got to at least try and ask, but what caused your apocalypse? <laughs> so it's actually a range of things. I mean, there are some events that we'll reveal as part of the story, but it is... Um, it's a combination of factors. We try to be, you know, realistic within certain bounds, but it's a, it's a fall of society. It is, um, you know, environmental collapse, rising sea levels, a, another, um, you know, global recession or, or, or just basically economics, economic collapse, um, polit political divisiveness and the, the, extreme um division that you see in the world you know just just look at twitter any day uh look at american politics look at, at most of the politics in europe and, and here in australia as well um people are being pushed further and further apart you know sometimes as a result of the technologies we have and sometimes very intentionally by the the strategies of of, of politicians so we have fictionalized a a a second American civil war that divides along the political lines, the, you know, the, the left and the right, that then inspires more countries around the world to sort of do the same. And then you end up having two major large, uh, you know, it's not an axis and allies, but it is like that. We've done a lot of research. Uh, my co-founder, he's, um, you know, his background is in environmental economics and he really understands these uh, political relationships and, the, you know, a lot of the socioeconomic factors that might go into deciding which uh, countries would ally themselves with which other countries. And we, you know, we've taken a bit of liberties there, but we've, we've basically gone, what can we see in the world today? Well, we have, you know, we have climate change and we have massive amounts of poverty and overpopulation. Um, you know, it's been a while since we felt we were on the brink of war. I don't think we're there now, but we could fictionalize that as well. And all of these things come together, you know, there, there will be, nuclear bombs and they will have been um you know devastating war but there are other things at, at play as well so by the time broken roads begins it's maybe a hundred years or so after these events and um there is no centralized government there's no centralized um you know electricity or running water or anything like that and it's 
it's definitely little pockets of people trying to rebuild and various other pockets that have just embraced the savagery that is allowing them to to get on top in a, in a lawless world. Wow. Um, you say all of that and I'm just like, so it's like five weeks from now. It's <laughs> September, you know. Yeah. It's, Man, uh, I was yeah. hoping to at least make it to my birthday. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, so, yeah, we, there, there have been a few happenings um, since we started the, 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 the narrative, like the early sort of timeline of events, which we wrote, I think we got our first draft maybe in March last year. And there have been things that have happened in the last, say, year, year and a half that have been like, this is, you know, this is actually scary. Um, so let's hope that it just stays the realm of fiction. Okay. Um, if I could cross my virtual fingers on, I would. There we go. It's a little, you know, untraditional, but hey, I made it work for me. There you uh, go. You're also keeping any vampires at bay, so. Yeah, you know, uh, thankfully, I don't think I coded any into this world, but you can't be too safe. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of alluded to this earlier in the introduction, uh, and you definitely alluded to it uh, when talking about Kirsten, but, or Kirsten, Kirsten? Kirsten, yeah. Okay. You, you, with the spelling on that, you never know. You never know. Um, and you really have put together a kind of, you know, Avengers of development talent. <laughs> well, thanks a lot. Yeah. No, we, you know, we worked really hard to build, to build a team we're incredibly proud of. Yeah. I mean, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier before the show, and I had mentioned, you know, told my fallout back joke then. Um, I'm going to stand by it, and anybody takes it, you got words Rock for solid. me. Yeah, you know, great one. You know, and then you had mentioned, well, that makes a lot of sense, because you have this wonderful guy by the name of Colin McComb on your team who has a ridiculous track record mm -hmm. with these kinds of games. Uh, just to name a few for everybody, uh, he worked on a little game called Fallout 2, uh, Torment, Tides of Numenara, uh, Planescape Torment, Wasteland 2 and 3, Divinity Original Sin, like, this guy's resume reads like a Bioware founder, <laughs> is really the best way to put it. Mm. Um, and so, you know, so you've got that, you've got Tim Sunderland, your audio lead, and you told me he's making instruments for the apocalypse. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I haven't, uh, I don't want to speak out of turn here. Maybe Tim can describe it in more detail himself at some point. But the idea was, let's think about what people in this world might have, might be able to have you know, around them and construct some instruments, record some sounds, you know, I, I don't know, empty tin cans and drums and like, you know, invent, invented string instruments and so on that you could feasibly find after the collapse of the world and then record music into the soundtrack and into the game um that's built off yeah basically post-apocalyptic instruments let's say yeah that is um what's the uh what's the word i'm looking for here borderline crazy <laughs> sometimes you got to do some borderline crazy things and you know fail a few times and the successes though are, are worth all of those failures well, we are all in and around game development, so I think we all fully understand borderline crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But, I mean, and then, of course, we, we already talked about Kirsten and her lovely art, uh, and then you've, uh, your uh, Ryan G, or is it G or G? G, Ryan G. G. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, your VFX artist that you, and I quote, we discovered by accident while scrolling through Twitter. Exactly right. So I was, I, I don't know what I was doing that day. And I saw this, um, this really cool animation of a, a character viewed from isometric perspective, which is, you know, I've always got an eye for, for when that when I see something like that, because that's the how our game is presented. Um, you know, quite beautifully animated character that seemed to be casting a, a spell and doing some um, you know, just having certain magical effects that that looked really good. Like I said, this is this is really um, cool. Uh, you know, just just visually what this person had managed to do. And I had a had a quick look, and I was like, you know, this 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 guy's got a whole lot of talent. Let's let's speak to him, see what he's about. Maybe he's got some things that could really fit our world. You know, there's things that we wanted to do with with dust blowing and obviously explosions and 
you know, fire and just a whole bunch of, you know, the post-apocalyptic suitable things. And we got chatting. Uh, he was 19 at the time. Um, he'd already been using Unity for, for eight years. So, you know, started at 11 years old. He's, he's 20 now. Um, I don't know that many 20-year-olds. You've already got nine years of experience using Unity. But we, we managed to snag him before uh, any others picked up on his talent. So, you know, yay for us. Sorry for the other studios out there that might have picked him up. He's... Uh, He's in Canada. He's part of our, you know, distributed team. There's, there's, uh, while most of us are here in Torquay, we've got, um, you know, Colin is in Detroit, and my co-founder Jethro, he's in California, and and Ryan is in Canada. So, yeah, happy that, you know, if I hadn't been on Twitter that day, I might not have had him, and our game certainly wouldn't look as good, because part of the, uh, the visual target and that style you've seen in the game, it it all has to be done, as I'm sure you and many of the people watching know has to be done with shaders and with lighting and so many other things that are Ryan's responsibility. So we've only been able to realize, you know, Kirsten's artistic vision through, through Ryan's uh, technical skills. Yeah. Um, I uh, don't know how to do a bunch of those things, <laughs> but thankfully uh, there is a very large database called YouTube, uh, <laughs> which, which yes. helps me learn those things. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. My fictional cat lives in Detroit. Hey, go, knock on Colin's door, but <laughs> actually don't do that. He <laughs> might think that's creepy. Um, and in fact, I, I don't condone randomly knocking on strangers doors. Uh, certainly not. Yeah. Not unless you're like a delivery person, you know, bringing them a delivery. So, um, yeah, uh, that's kind of crazy. You know, like, uh, I, I do believe the word I'm looking for in this situation is something like kismet, you know, uh, where, where I, I don't personally ascribe any belief to there being some great order to the universe, but there is always that, that those things that happen that make you think that there is a reason why things mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. So yeah. In, in, in my experience, the harder you work, the luckier you get. You know, the more time you put into something, the more instances, the more opportunity you create for uh, those good things to come along. So it can it can certainly appear a certain way, um, but there's definitely a, a, a tie with the energy put into something, you know, the, the physical effort and the time put in. And maybe that's why good things happen for Liam, because he sleeps 30 minutes a day and is online 23 and a half. And the I, rest of the I day. Could sleep 30 minutes a day. That's not true at all. I love sleeping. Uh, hmm. If I don't get like at least six hours, bleh, grumpy robot. Yeah. Um, Much you know, the same. You know, this guy's got to recharge, folks. Uh, I also wish that I could actually pick up this coffee cup. But hmm. one day. Uh, we're the sh the sh my show like life is a work in progress um and then we also have jacques lehman your technical mm. lead uh who's been doing a lot of the level assembly and kind of bringing your style into a your 2d kind of look into a three-dimensional world yeah, as well exactly as his right. wife melanie yeah exactly right so um, I'm originally from South Africa. I've been in Australia for about three and a half years. And when I was looking for some additional uh, developer assistance on this, I looked up local game developers. And there's only one other studio in Torquay, and it happens to be run by a South African who's lived here for a number of years. And you know, he he thought when I reached out to him, he thought, no, this you know this has got to be a scam, or this has to be like you know it, it can't be because Torquay is a, a relatively small town on the coast here in in Victoria. Um, he thought, no, there's, there's just no way that there's another South African has started a game studio here in Torquay. Uh, but we met up and, you know, Baldur's Gate is his favorite game of all time. And, you know, mine, mine is Baldur's Gate too. And we got on over a, a beer and a, and a burger and, you know, next thing he's, he's looking at our engine and looking at what we've been doing and came up with some, you know, genuinely quite novel ways of projecting um, the art that you've seen in the game onto 3D models. So, you know, we get everything hand-drawn. Um, one of the things, I don't know if I mentioned to you yet, but we've got the same art team that did Shadowrun Returns. So if you know that RPG series I from Hairbrain Steams, so it's the same. Now, they have extensive experience doing um, isometric and tile-based art. So we use a combination of, of um, you know, 
whole assets and tile based assets we got all of the 2d because that they do everything by hand on you know we say by hand but it's on tablet by hand yeah. um, and that's how they achieve we achieve this look and we had a world that was much like the way Shadowrun did it where you know you've got your you've got your flat tiles and you've got your 3d characters and you've got like blob shadows and you've sort of fake lighting and whatever and shark had a look at all this and he's like you know I, let me try something um, and a day later, he had created models behind some of the artwork, created like genuine lighting, genuine shadows, and basically done a reverse of how, you know, you might think traditional assets or 3D assets are made. We get a model and you texture it and you put it in the world and so on. We've got the fixed perspective. We've got the artwork drawn from there, and then we actually model it afterwards. And that allows us to cast realistic shadows, have you know, Ryan's VFX do amazing things, um, you know, genuine dynamic lighting and ex explosion effects and all the particles and stuff that are really affecting the environment uh, and not just sort of the enclosed space, almost as an overlay, uh, which which older RPGs had to do. So yeah. we, we've, we you know, there's some things going on in Broken Roads that while it is, it's kind of, you know, I don't want to say 2.5D, even though that's a term people understand. It's a, it's a combination of 2D artwork with, with genuinely new um, 3D effects. Wow. Very, very, yeah, very happy with that. And, you know, I, I believe it was novel enough um, to be introducing something new to the genre. We spoke with some consultants who deal with the Australian government's um, research and development tax incentive, and they had a look at what we were doing, and they considered it sufficiently novel to actually give us a, a small government incentive to complete the, the um, production of this this. Uh, you know, technical approach that Jacques came up with. Oh, very nice. Yeah, so no, that's... the team is like you said, it's it's a uh, build it all together. This this Avengers team, like you said, and I'm you know I couldn't be happy because we've had things come out of the synthesis of people that I didn't imagine. They far exceeded what I imagined that we'd we'd go for in terms of goals. You know, so yeah, super happy. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it, it truly sounds like a dream team of everybody just coming together at this perfect moment with, with these ideas to just, just, yeah, explode goodness onto the internet. Um, <laughs> so big question here, because we don't get, generally get things outside of Mad Max set in Australia. Why? Why I mean, Australia? Yeah, why Australia? Isn't it dangerous enough? Well, I mean, it's it's interesting. I think there's a lot of stuff you can play up on that. Uh, it does have this, you know, um, impression to the rest of the world. I mean, in some ways, quite rightly so, of, of every creature here is out to kill you and the mm -hmm. landscape's out to kill you and the mm -hmm. sun is out to kill you mm -hmm. and, you know. Um, but it's also, I think, just under underutilized in games. I mean, I... I had the idea of originally going sort of across country in Broken Roads. You sort of start near Perth and you make your way across the whole country. Now, anyone who's worked in games probably has had to reduce their scope at some point. It didn't take very long before I realized, no, I'm not going to be able to make it across Australia. Let's just make it across Western Australia. Um, and I flew over there and I, I drove around to a lot of the towns and a lot of the locations that are in the game. Um, and it's just, it, it's incredibly beautiful. Like the, the colors and the landscape, it's, it's almost, you know, post-apoc ready. And you drive through these, these wheat belt towns, the wheat belt is an area, um, just outside of Perth. And a lot of them are, you know, their industries have moved on. And so the towns and a lot of the people have had to move on. So you leave the big city and you, you drive through towns where it's like every house is for sale and it's getting dilapidated and, you know, you get to sort of the next big city where they maybe got a, uh, I don't know, train station or a farming hub or something like that, and you know, their industry's still going. But there's there's a there's definitely some essence of hinting at what Broken Roads is about and hinting at a at a possible future where, you know, it happens with mining towns where they were amazing boomers, you know, booming world until the uh, the mine dried up or that thing was no longer in demand. And I think you can see that with a, with a few towns in, in Western Australia. So yeah, you just, you've got that landscape, you've got, you know, those, those films, the Mad Max films, I think that Fury Road was, was maybe filmed in South Africa and Namibia, but yeah. the first three films, you can see the, um, that landscape, which is, you know, there's parts of Victoria, there's parts of South Australia as well. It's just so 
so right for a, a world that is dried and, you know, maybe kind of left behind, you know, by people. And, and Western Australia just has so many places already, so many interesting old parts of, say, Edwardian um, architecture from, you know, when, they, when it was first sort of colonized and people were spreading through, uh, plus the fact that there's over a million feral camels running around Australia at the moment, which is why we've got camels in our key art, much hardier than horses, much more likely to survive. You know, these, these beasts of burden that, 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 you know, work in Northern, Northern Africa and through middle, uh, the Middle East are also were very, very integral to, um, when Europeans came and landed and got set up in, in Australia as well. So you can drive around and see camels, which is something you probably, you know, you see a kangaroo and a koala bear and a camel is probably people don't know. You'll see that third one. Yeah, I, I, I like to think that I know more about the world around me than the average American. And uh, I was aware of your cane toad problem mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, just, uh, you know, rats, mice, you know, stuff like that. But camels? <laughs> Yeah, look, you know, camels is also their problem depending on, you know, who you ask. Like some people think that they're awesome and, you know, you can use them for milk and you can use them for meat. And then for a lot of farmers, they, you know, they are a problem. So they're, they're definitely quite a, a contentious creature because they they thrive in the conditions here. Just, so they're just wild. They're just completely wild. Obviously, there are farms and so on. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I haven't made up my mind whether they're a problem yet or not, you know, the kind of beautiful, kind of awesome, but they also are most certainly not, um, you know, indigenous. So yeah, huh. tough one. Well, there is your ecology lesson for the episode. Camels in Australia are an invasive species. Yeah, most certainly. Nice. You know, I like to have uh, at least one lesson of ecology every week. And I that think, I this, help. yeah, I think this week I've had two. Uh, so yeah, I mean, Australia already has like to this, uh, you know, at least for the rest of the world, I imagine for you living there that Australia is very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Normal mm -hmm. because you live there. Whereas for the rest of us above the equator, it has this very kind of wild, uh, you know, th this wild sense about it that certainly isn't helped by all of the animals wanting to kill you. Um, yeah. you, you until you solve your spider problem, I'm never coming. Mm -hmm. Well, you talk about spiders. I mean, just here, we, we had to have the house fumigated because we had a, the whole area had like a, a red back. You should look that spider up. We had a no, red back. You infestation <laughs> <laughs> so yeah we had a redback infestation and, and you know we had a guy out here in like a full hazmat suit spraying all over and um and, and all the neighbors as well like that's just par for the course i suppose you know now where um where tim lives up in um brockhampton i think they've got some different stories probably a lot closer to the uh the cane toad issues and it's also more tropical like we, we're a little bit cooler down here in uh, Torquay but up there that's when you start to get you know spiders that have webs that catch birds for instance because you know flies and <laughs> butterflies and the like aren't enough so the Australian spiders literally catch birds so why not um, pythons and yeah he, he, he deals with a totally different range of um, you know fauna to, <laughs> to what bothers me down here well, uh, this has been a great show guys I'm gonna go uh, <laughs> blast off to the moon because spiders <laughs> can't survive in vacuum that i know of we'll we'll evolve one down here and, and, and get it up to the moon with you just yeah, please, just please you know just just leave them down with you that's fine you know clearly australians are tougher than everyone else so <laughs> just saying just saying um now one of the things i noticed in the trailer uh is that you have a moral compass so instead of, uh, you know, Mass Effect and Fallout and modern games, uh, which have a very, uh, you know, excuse me, a two-sided morality kind of thing with, you know, Renegade mm -hmm. Paragon, Karma a systems, yeah. you're taking a more complex look at the morality and ethics of mm -hmm. the player character. I actually have an image to show people, too. 
Um, so yeah, look, this was just born out of you know my my background before I got into this industry. I, I studied um, philosophy in undergrad and political philosophy and philosophy and honors and master's degrees. Um, found that there were so many interesting things that you know thought experiments and moral quandaries and just stories that that you can put a a, a person through that there is really no clear right and clear wrong answer. Um, and I just, yeah, going even further back to the days of, of Ultima, now maybe some of your, your viewers, maybe yourself, remember the Ultima games by um, Richard Garriott, the early Origin games. They had virtues that were integral to the story and integral to, to the game. Uh, I found that super interesting. They had spirituality, honor, compassion, um, honesty, I can't remember them all right now. Um, and I just found that super interesting. Like this, this is something that is integral to the game. It doesn't ha you know, hit you over the head with it, but it's something that you can learn more about in your, in your own time. Like what is the origin of these things and, and, and how does it sort of fit into the world? Uh, and I didn't really see that developed. I think it's been really, really underserved in games since, um, you know, philosophy, morality, ethics, you often find, you know, some really cool systems like Dungeons and Dragons has nine, you know, from, from lawful good to chaotic evil. You get the Paragon and Renegade, like you said, and karma systems. But even the Force, like Star Wars, has a light side, dark side. There's very often a, a simple binary and you're somewhere along a straight spectrum. Um, and I thought, well, it's, it's even that, that kind of assumes you're between two poles of, of, of right and wrong. Um, and if we have a, a sort of a compass, like a 360 degree compass that also has gradations from the center to the outside on, on how sort of extreme something is, we might be able to get something far more fluid and far more, uh, representative of, of the real world, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty vocal about, I think Twitter is, is great for marketing. It's essential part of the you know, the games industry at the moment, but it's also a technology that is necessarily divisive because it has to distill complex issues to, you know, one or two tweets with like 140 characters or 280, whatever it is. Um, you don't get, you don't capture the real world. You simply capture, this is my idea. And if you dislike it, you're the worst. And hopefully a hundred of my followers will shout at you and therefore I win and, you know, we don't investigate anything. Um, and you know, look at how integral social media and, and, um, you know, Twitter and the like is to electoral campaigns like presidential campaigns and, and so on at the moment. Um, mm. I didn't want to have my game have a, you know, such a reductive take on such complex issues. So you, you put, you know, and also it's, it's not a game that needs you to have a philosophy degree before you can even understand it. And it's also not one that you're going to leave, you know, having played it, understood all these complex things. It's, it's fun first. The game is meant to be fun, but dealing with complex moral issues there, the post-apocalyptic setting is perfect for that. You know, you can create little thought experiments. Hey, there's a starving family on the side of the road. If you don't give them some food and water, they will die. But if you do give them some food and water, the 20 people in your convoy might not make it to, to shelter. They might not make it within the city gates and raiders are going to kill them all. You know, that's yeah. a, that's a simple utilitarian, you know, is the lives of two people worth the lives of, of risking 20 people, you know, for instance. And because we have the compass with the worldview, that worldview is the sort of golden arc on there that Excuse expands, me. that expands and, and, um, goes further out towards the edge and sort of gets narrower depending on like, let's say I take a lot of, um, Machiavellian choices. My position on the, on the moral compass slowly moves towards being in the Machiavellian quadrant, but also narrows my worldview. So I can start to make sort of more focused Machiavellian choices, unlocking moral traits, which I'll get to in a second. Um, but also I become narrow minded. So it starts with broad and it actually gets narrow if you take a lot of decisions in one quadrant. But if you start to make decisions on the edges of any of your worldview that sort of maybe dips into other quadrants, you're, you'll become less extreme, you will become more broad minded. So you know, there's parallels to real world thinking as well, you get so focused on one ideology, you got blinkers to the rest of the world. Or if you are super broad minded, you might not have a lot of depth and knowledge or you know, depth in a particular um, 
you know, area, for instance. So the whole thing moves, you know, we're doing a lot of iteration on this, how far a choice is on the, the dialogue, for instance, you make it an existentialist decision of which we've changed to um, humanist, which I'll, I'll get to in a bit as well. You make a humanist decision and it's this far from where you currently are in the moral compass. You will shift ever so slightly. So thanks a lot for bringing that up. So um, you'll shift ever so slightly on the moral compass. Um, so your decisions are not only limited by, but also affected by your worldview. Now, this is a, an early prototype. You can see the white dot. It's actually meant to be within the worldview, which is the sort of golden arc. And that golden arc is meant to be extending past the white dot. Um, total work in progress, pre-alpha, you know, give us a, a, a week or two more and we're going to get a, an updated trailer out that shows this off in, in far more detail. Um, but I wanted something that would allow somebody to make very nuanced decisions. So it's 360 degrees around, 100 points from center to the edge. So there's 36,000 possible places that any decision can be. So the borders are very important as well. Uh, the borders between the quadrants, say utilitarianism, if you want to sort of boil it down, it is, you know, the greatest good for the greatest number. So that's a very sort of community focused thing. The far opposite is, is a hard nihilist, very selfish, very, you know, interested only in yourself and, and everything as you go around, you know, we try to make it sensible and, and, and okay. So if I'm located there on the moral compass, um, you know, that is congruent with how I imagine decisions that are halfway between those other points are. So, you know, so far, so good. We've we've been able to do some really interesting things with moral traits, which is if you have a, that worldview, that arc, golden arc, and there are certain traits we've designed, if it's covering, say, for instance, um, we have better fear than loved. It's a, it's a Machiavellian quote. If you have this trait active, you're able to select certain unique dialogue choices. Um, maybe you can open up certain combat um, options that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, like there could be some nihilistic, you know, a pipe bomb or something like that, that a, a person of any decency would not employ in combat, for instance. And then maybe if you're a particularly humanist or utilitarian character, um, an, an enemy could beg for their life and you would never allow that if you were, you know, totally brutal, but you might, you know, offer to is like, what can you give me for your life versus straight up? Yeah, sure. I'll let you go because it's just the right thing to do. We wanted to have all those gradations, but without letting the player be the paragon on this quest and then the renegade in the next, you know, like you could play through some of the old star Wars games and you could be the, you know, example, greatest Jedi Knight ever. But then if you get to the end and you're like, Hmm, I think that the, the Sith ending is probably more cool. I'm going to take this evil option that is completely, out of line with how I've role played the last 30 hours of this game. So we were like, well, no, what if we make it that you can only make things that are consistent with your character, but just like in real life, you can make slow shifts to your worldview that by, you know, you can start off really good and you can slowly track a character's fall or, or vice versa. Well, uh, I have to say that as a utilitarian nihilist, I'm really looking forward to trying to break your compass. <laughs> well, we, um, you know, we're going live with this next week. So I'll give you a little bit of a, a preview of the feature that we, we're building in now. It's called Moral Memory. That's just the working title. Whenever you take a decision in a particular quadrant, you will slowly increase a, a persisting amount within that quadrant. And then other choices that are sort of low level um, decisions that might be within your moral memory, they will occur to that character. So even though you've shifted and you've become, you know, much more focused on the good of the group, you'll still be able to make decisions that um, were consistent with what you can remember being. You know, it's not it's not like a person is incapable of thinking of an awful thing. It's just whether they would necessarily act on that. Um, finding that balance between restricting players and it's still allowing enough freedom of, of choice to not feel like, okay, this is an interesting mechanic, but I actually feel like I was, I was prevented from doing exactly what I wanted to do in that moment. That's where a lot of the testing and balancing of, of the system is going to come into play. Nice. Um, well, I feel like it is an appropriate time to tell my audience that if you guys have any questions, throw them up in chat. I'll go ahead, ask Craig, and hopefully... You ask a question that he can answer. He actually gave me a whole list of stuff he's not willing to talk about. So <laughs> if you ask a question that's on that list, I'll just make fun mm. of you. I still love you all. 
but I'll make fun of you. That's good. But man, I tell you, uh, one, I look forward to trying to break that system mm. either way. Uh, because, uh, oh, Drago here, does the game have factions that you will affect with your choices during the game? Yeah, so we we absolutely will. We've got, um, you've got your convoy, which is the, the, you know, it's not strictly, but about 20 people that, that you're moving with. Um, and they have sort of their own identity as well as you individually as the player character. There's different towns, there's different cities, there's different players within those towns. There's also certain um, guilds and, and factions and collectors, which I won't go into too much detail now, that there are very complex relationships between them. And your character, at character creation, you have to choose an origin story. You know, you, maybe you were part of a barter crew. Maybe you were a, a jackaroo, which is like a farmhand at the, the, you know, the cattle stations in Australia. Uh, maybe you're a hired gun, like a mercenary, or maybe you were a surveyor, you know, part of a cartography guild that plotted out where are the settlements in the outback, where are the, the, um, you know, the, the new pathways and routes and, and, and unmapped, uncharted places that have established since, since society fell. And people are willing to pay for that information because, you know, you could see why hired guns, the mercenaries might want to know, okay, well, where, there's an unprotected settlement, you know, unprotected means either there's money for us to protect them or there's money from somebody who might want to take what they've got. The barter crews might want to know what the surveyors know about a particular area because they can establish a new trade route. So all of those things, as well as a little bit of, um, you know, infighting and that kind of thing. And what you do as a player could reflect badly on your convoy and so on. Um, so absolutely there's a full reputation system. Um, and, Obviously, your moral choices are really going to piss certain people off because the system allows characters to have uh, their own moral compass. So while you see yours as the player character, when we create a new character in the world, an NPC or a party member companion, we can plot where they are on the moral compass. And depending on if there's enough overlap or enough opposites, they will react in different ways to what you do. So, you know, we might have you might have a party composition Let's think of Dungeons and Dragons, a good example. You're a paladin, uh, you can only be lawful good, and then you're traveling with a, an evil companion, for instance, yeah. and they don't <laughs> like what they do, and eventually they, they run away or they leave or something like that. We can do very, very complex um, you know, mixes of, of, of different moral leanings. Well, I imagine that any Machiavellian uh, caravan members are not going to like my nihilistic utilitarian outlook <laughs> on the world. But that's well, fine. Well, the borders, you know, there, there's part of, of um, the way it's designed, the top border of Machiavellianism lines up with utilitarianism because, the, the you know, the root of Machiavellianism was how to rule, how to maintain power in the most effective way possible. And that can be done either for a good of a group or, or even just for the good of the individual. And then the good of the individual at the border of the Machiavellian and nihilistic quadrants, you start going into incredibly selfish acts for the individual. And then that goes around to humanism, which is slightly less, but still self-focused and still individual focused, which is, is starts to get a little bit nicer as it were right through to the good of the group. And then when you're in the utilitarian, the good of the group, that's when you can start going, well, you know, we got to let these two, this, this, the starving family die for the good of the group, which takes you back all the way around to Machiavellianism. So those borders, they, they are quite significant. And you, you might find that, geez, I actually had some Machiavellian leanings I didn't know about uh, that you can discover while you're, you're playing this game. We're all complex creatures. Huh. Uh, Phoenix44 uh, asks, will characters come and go depending on your moral choices? And I think you touched on that uh, mm. when talking about uh, factions and the mm. like. Um, yeah. Yeah. Look, I I don't like it in Baldur's Gate, but I know that certain people do. I don't like it in Baldur's Gate and similar RPGs when I role play the way I want to role play and I lose a companion as a result. That's a personal game preference. I'd rather they were grumpy but stuck by me, or maybe they, um, you know, just complain a lot or something like that. But when I've had people leave my party. I've often want like it's dissatisfying, like especially if it's somebody who 
you know, you're midway through their quest and you want to play through that content or something like that. So the approach that I'm trying, um, this could totally change and it'll all just really be about feel and, and what community reactions are. The approach I'm trying is around morale and initiative and combat and reactions and so on. That if you do something that makes somebody, one of your companions, progressively unhappier, they they can become despondent because our characters can also have conditions on them. Um, you know, think of say bleeding or or fatigued or whatever that affects their stats. Now we can have like despondency or you know just general dissatisfaction regarding your moral choices, and that could affect say their initiative in combat. So while somebody used to be really effective, they're just generally depressed and unhappy. They start to act later and later in the turn queue. Um, just you know, just things like that. Maybe they they instead of leaving your party, they will return to the convoy and be unwilling to engage on particular quests. You know, so the companions might say, "Look, if we go and do this, I'm out. You know, I'm not quitting the convoy. You can have me for another quest in the future, but no, I'm not willing to break into the mayor's home and and you know take her son and hold him ransom, for instance." So, so kind of like how in Mass Effect uh, Two, everybody had the loyalty mission, and depending on how you made those final decisions, would determine whether or not you maintained the loyalty and were able to progress dialogue trees and stuff like mm. that with the character. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nice. So, so I think that it's going to take a lot of testing and a lot of balancing, um, but there might be companion quests that you can always do and then companion quests that are only if you've got within the you know if your if your morality overlaps sufficiently um i really do want replayability to be a big part of this game so it's not going to be you know a 50 60 hour epic it's probably more going to be 20 to 30 hours but replayability and genuinely seeing like wow there was an entirely separate path and it's not just well i could have lockpicked or killed the guard or snuck around like those are really short multiple solutions they're awesome fallout really broke new ground with that but i think there can be longer parts that really get you questioning and then those themselves branch off into different um, moral choices along the way you know and then you start throwing in that you have an origin story you know you have a um a jackaroo might have a skill set or a, a surveyor may have knowledge so on you start combining that it starts to get, you know, really, really complex. You've got four moral quadrants. You've got four origin stories. You've got potentially 16 solutions for everything. Now, obviously, we're not going to have 16 solutions. The scope is completely beyond what a small team can do. But we do want to find significant moments where your your moral leaning, your, your philosophical leaning, um, and your origin story can create a, a new experience that might give you, say, a 30-minute or an hour playthrough that you wouldn't get if you didn't have that um, that that that, two, that intersection at that point, then you want to replay it. Like, well, what if I was a Machiavellian uh, gun for hire at that point in the quest? Um, Drago brings up an interesting point that uh, there uh, there might be some level of frustration in players uh, who tend to play games in that more abstract way, as you kind of mentioned. Because uh, one of the examples you used was uh, playing a Star Wars game and then as a Jedi, uh, you know, a paragon of the light side, making a dark side choice at the end, which may seem out of character to an extent, mm. but at the same time could very well be a an in-character action as evidenced uh, by using Star Wars The Last Jedi here. Uh, you know, Luke made a mistake with Ben Solo. You know, and that that was a, a an action that we all kind of thought may have been out of character, but you know, made sense when he had the opportunity to explain it. Mm. You know, uh, but I guess uh, from my perspective on this, the only way to find out is to will be to play the game. Mm. And look, I mean, he he raises sorry because I've just yeah. seen the question. Um, he raises the concern, you know, the concern about if it's being frustrated and restricting. Um, that's what we're going to have to test and balance. That's why, specifically why we brought in moral memory. Um, so that even if you do shift, you're not completely prevented from, from making decisions on the, the other end of the, the moral compass. Um, he's, he's totally right. Like this game is, is meant to be role played, uh, as opposed to just clicking choices and seeing how they turn out. 
because everything's data driven, because everything's run by numbers, like, you know, we can turn it off. We can change restrictions on the the moral memory. Like we, we kind of wanted to start that everyone has 25% of the compass filled out in every quadrant. Every time you make a decision in a, in a quadrant, you get an additional um, sort of pixel percent, if that makes sense, in that um, in that quadrant. And you can still move the, the, the world view around. So yeah, it's just got to be fun. It's got to be tested. It's it's fun first. And if we get too much feedback that like, hey man, this is too restrictive, we can tweak all the numbers. We can make your base morality uh, persist for longer, and we can make your um, make it faster to move around the moral compass, uh, and so on. Sorry for that graphical error right there. Uh, if it's not one thing on the show, it's something <laughs> else. Um, Did the audio persist? Should I? No, no the audio persisted. Bigger? It was all in. Uh, 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 there was a glitch in the matrix, and I had to solve it. So, well, dang, man, you came with significantly heavier answers than I was expecting. Uh, Given it a lot of thought over the last year and a half. You know, I, it, I can tell. Uh, dang. Um, oh, uh, Drago with another question. How is travel to work? Is it a hub world with set areas or more just go randomly or maybe some restrictions with opening okay. areas? Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to say very little on this because we haven't revealed that at all. And we're still not revealing it this early. Um, all I will say is there is a distinction between convoy and party. So the convoy can be somewhere and the party can be exploring elsewhere basically and there are definitely hub and major areas uh, there is a path through the game but there's a lot of freedom um, while you go through that path slash paths depending on your moral choices um, so yeah we we do want to allow exploration but your party is not always limited to where your convoy is nice well uh uh give chat like another minute or so here to come up with uh, some more questions, but unless we don't have any more, it's going to be uh, time for my personal favorite part of the show. <laughs> and it, it's a doozy this week. And by this week, I mean today it's, you know, I, I talk like it's a weekly show, but it's basically <laughs> a daily show, but not the, not daily, the daily show. show. No, no, I'm I'm not Trevor Noah. I am not one of your fellow South Africans. Um, I do love how he has really grown into that show. I will say. So, all right, Dennis Proud. Yeah, he he really has. He's a funny guy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It looks like we don't have any. Up oh, one more. I may have missed combat. Is it turn-based or something? Yeah. Else? So so we're actually going to be showing off a lot of combat uh, in our next trailer. It is turn-based. Screenshot for it. Yep, that you can bring that up. Actually, yeah, but thanks a lot. Um, that screenshot reflects the UI, um, the grid-based movement, the cover system. It's got a combination of action points and movement points. We do allow certain talents and abilities to let you say use additional action points or movement points. Um, and because we've moved from, as I mentioned, really quite quite a bit early in the show from a a 2D tile-based game to a full 3D environment. We were able to do certain things with line of sight and ray casting while sticking to the turn-based, um, sorry, grid-based combat. So, you know, maybe you're hiding behind the bus over there and you've got half, um, you know, half cover. If you don't have a line of sight to, you know, direct line of sight to say that, that Raider Scout, you won't be able to shoot. But if you're on the other side of the, the, um, the wrecked car, because that wrecked car is hollow and those windows are open and there's a direct path through the door, you can actually have a line of sight to the Raider Scout and still enjoy your, your cover, for instance. So there's a few things where it's not hard-coded into the vehicle. You've got this much cover and it blocks line of sight. It literally will look through the model uh, if, you know, because obviously you can aim a gun through the window of a burnt-out car. So those are the kinds of things that we, we've also uh, experimenting with here as well. Very nice. 
uh fictional cat i don't have any questions but i am now interested in the game <laughs> cool and awesome to hear thank you that's precisely why i bring these people on the show cool. um nice uh love these type of games that have to get my pillar peeps interested in this mm -hmm. game looking forward to new stuff so well, thanks a lot drago pillars has definitely been an influence and the the games that influence pillars uh and especially all the improvements that obsidian made with pillars to um spend a lot of time looking at uh, quality of life improvements and just how they've handled uh, such a big world. Obviously, our game won't be as big as Pillars 2, but there's a lot that we we looked at and, and what you know they've refined it. Those are experts in the genre. Uh, Pillars 2, I think, is one of the best role playing games of the last decade. So you you're definitely in in company that appreciates the same uh, role playing games. Nice. Well then, it's time for the five questions. For those of you who are new here, and in case you're unaware, Craig, the five questions are five questions that I put together ahead of time that have nothing to do with anything we've talked about thus far in the show. But today, there's a theme to my questions. As you are from, or you live in Australia, uh, a land which is uh, known for its dangerous animals, I thought that I would ask you five questions about the least dangerous animals. Okay. So, question number one. The largest rodent in the world is also known as the friendliest animal in the world. What is it? Uh, is it the quokka? I could be wrong. The largest rodent. Is it a wombat? Huh. So, um, no, I think that's a marsupial. Well, the wombat is a marsupial. I... Okay. Uh, the largest rodent... I don't know. You're going to uh, have to help me out there. The largest rodent is the capybara. It is native to South ah, America. Absolutely. They're adorable. Yeah, they, uh, <laughs> they certainly are. Uh, I was thinking of Australian rodents. I'm trying to put my mind through what would the largest one be. But no, the capybara is a, a, a beautiful, noble beast. I indeed. saw one once, like very close. It was at a petting zoo, but it was sleepy, so it didn't want to be pet. <laughs> so it's friendly, you know. Yeah. Unassuming, unthreatening. Generally. You but, see, I mean, if there ever was anything like a capybara here, it would have been long. Oh, taken, it would have know, been selected some out like giant spiders years, years ago. You know? <laughs> All right. Question number two. Frequently depicted carrying an olive branch, which animal is recognized as an international symbol of peace? That would be a dove. That would be correct. Uh, and, and you would probably find them in the spider webs here, by the way. Yeah. Them. Probably. And bonus Built little between piece of... the uh, olive tree branches to catch those doves, you see. <laughs> well, bonus bit of information don't show them to Martians. Yep. There you go. Very good. <laughs> uh, question number three. A classic. Yeah. I, I love that movie. I have to, I like to throw little jokes like that out there. Uh, earlier this week, I had Sean Bateshu, who played The Wrench in Watch Dogs 2, and I threw a reference to hackers out there. Mm. Didn't get it. Oh, and I'm like, come on. Not, not enough of a huge nerd, unfortunately. Yeah, apparently not. Did not do his hacking research. So, question number three. Despite their frightful appearance and affinity to eating meat, which group of avian scavengers are you least likely to have a violent encounter with? Hmm. Um... I guess maybe parrots. Um, when you know some some of the friendly kind of raptor cousins, I guess. Uh, Can you be more uh, specific than that? Cockatoo. I was looking for vultures. Okay, right. Uh, Unfortunately, as, as they are scavengers, whereas uh, animals like parrots and cockatoos tend to be more. Uh, I don't know what the word is for, for the ones that eat fruit. Mm. A, uh, another thing about vultures is that they're maybe Tim could tell you more. They're particularly good singer songwriters. If you've seen the jungle book, I, which version the, there is only one version. Okay. We're talking made by the, the, the animated, animated Disney. Version. <laughs> the same, you know? <laughs> oh, uh, my friend, Brian, uh, says, we should note you win absolutely nothing 
for this mini game. Yeah, but, just a, just a bit of embarrassment and a bit of uh, showing of how little I know about vultures, capybaras, and <laughs> but yet you know about doves. But the question really is: Do you know about the animal for number four? Prized for their pelts, which mischievous aquatic mammal was almost hunted to extinction over the last few centuries? Hmm, is that a beaver? Close. An otter. You got it. Cool. Yep, I was uh, I was going for the otter. Uh, beavers are not so mischievous, but speaking from personal experience with otters and their cousins, uh, they are mischievous little bastards, and I can't help but love them. Cool. Uh, so you've gotten two questions right. Now this is the most important question. Question number five. It's it's a two parter. Hit me. Do you play Pokemon Go? And can you trade me some of your region specific Pokemon? I don't play Pokemon Go. I can't trade you anything related to Pokemon. I've never played any Pokemon game. Not even when I had a Game Boy Color 20 years ago. Yes, I know. That's, I'm glad you only asked me now, not, not the start. Uh, I think Pokemon missed me by less than five years. I think I, when it was really big, I was about 19 or 20 years old and I was just 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 out of that uh, target market and i was playing the um link's awakening remake instead of pokemon yellow or blue or whatever it was at the time pokemon missed me as well i'm only a few years behind you but pokemon go has become a favorite of mine and my wife's because it's a game that we can play together and like go out on walks and all this stuff and i am just trying to get all of those stupid little <laughs> pocket monsters that are in continents that I'm very likely not going to go to anytime while this game is relevant. I think if you were to come to our Discord, and this is not a shameless plug for our Discord, if you were to come to our Discord, you'd probably find some Pokemon Go players from Australia that uh, would you know, be able to offer you more than I can. Okay, I might have to do that. And uh, I think my wife just fed my cat a second dinner. Was it a dove? No, it no. Dove? He would eat a dove. He'd catch a dove. Uh, uh, my cat, who lives in the garage with me, is a semi-feral cat that we rescued from Florida. So he is oh. basically about the baddest cat you can find. Mm -hmm. so, he'd survive in the post-apocalypse. Uh, he'd survive in Australia. I'm just putting that out there. So Even hardier. <laughs> I mean, I, I've watched a lot of Shark Week and Crocodile Hunter. I think I have the absolute bare minimum of an idea. <laughs> so Just stories of Australian life, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I have a friend who lives down there. She tells me all the time. And her Facebook is very frequently uh, something along the lines of, we have to leave our house for two days because this spider the size of a dinner plate showed up. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, why are you there again? <laughs> very clearly. Standard stuff. Yeah, very clearly the the uh, the intelligent mammals decided that island was not worth going to. Mm -hmm. that's there are marsupials. <laughs> but You got it. Yes. Uh, fictional cat knows about my actual cat. His name is Patrick. He's great. Um, well, Craig... You've been an excellent guest. Thank you. Uh, Thanks. you really enjoyed this. Yeah. Well, uh, you are absolutely welcome back when you get closer to release. Um, or if you have any exclusive information you want to give. Because cool. I like exclusives. I got, uh, you know. <laughs> cool. it, it well, be on the lookout more... for the, the trailer that um, Tim, Tim and I put together. Uh, there'll cool. be a bunch of new stuff in there coming soon. I'm down. I like trailers. Especially the kind that have new stuff in them. Yep. <laughs> a bunch of unseen footage, new locations, uh, and a couple of things that people have, have asked about today that I wasn't ready to speak about. Well, I'd ask you about it, but I imagine there's a bunch of things in there you can't tell me about. And either way, I actually like surprises, so I'll, cool. I can wait. Um, cool. awesome. bef oh. But before we go, where can everybody in the audience find you? 
Uh, I think that the best is probably Twitter, you know, at Drop Bear Bytes, much as I, I loathe the platform. I, you know, it's it's so good for networking and, and games marketing. We've obviously got our our Discord and Discord URLs are ugly and awful, so you're best linked from Twitter. Or obviously uh, brokenroadsgame.com. That links to um, you know all of our social platforms and uh, our Discord as well. And Tim maintains our Instagram as well. So all, all of those are linked from brokenroadsgame.com. Nice. Uh, I will probably also be posting on Instagram because at a couple awesome. times, my uh, right hand decided to just fly away from me. <laughs> and and uh, we noticed at one point your desk flew towards you. That was oh, impressive. that was uh, uh, when I uh, reboot the program. Uh, my desk starts further away, and I have a button which disappears as soon as I use it uh, that brings my desk back to me. Uh, you know, uh, the vagaries of, of all the things. Yes, Fictional Cat, you saw the blue button, but you didn't mm. see the red button. I wouldn't mind a button for car keys that brings them back to me because that happens a, a bit too often. Well, so sh share that tech, patent it, and man, the places you could go. I'm pretty sure that Apple has beat me to it with their whole start your car with your phone thing. So uh, unless that's not true, uh, I'll see what I can do about that. Um, but no promises. Hmm. So, uh, well, Craig, thanks again for joining us. It was a pleasure having you here. I can't wait yep. to see more from Broken Roads. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Oh, no problem. Pleasure's all mine. Uh, <laughs> Re really enjoyed talking. It's been a lot of fun. Nice. And thanks to everyone who asked questions. And sorry that uh, there were certain things we couldn't go into more detail. But, uh, you know, any any kind of enthusiasm, seeing these, you know, people that play Pillars or people that have questions about the moral compass, like it's all really encouraging. Uh, and sometimes the questions bring up things that you're like, oh, that's that's really important. We should consider that or, or work into our design. Um, so thanks a lot to everyone who, who chatted. See, guys, he thought I was fun. <laughs> but now is the time where I cut back over to this camera angle. And I say, thank you guys for coming. Thank you to uh, XB White, Bad Astro 69, Sunday, Sunday 87, and Phoenix 44 for the follows. Uh, I'm here four to five days a week. Uh, you can find my schedule at my Twitter at Tom Clancy. Uh, and sometimes I post about the show on Instagram at that Tom Clancy. Remember the H, it's important, even though it's silent. Uh, the next couple of days, I don't have anything lined up, but I will be on for Sunday to do some live reactions to the Ubisoft Forward stream. Um, yeah, that should be a really interesting stream, giving ever, given everything that's been going on with them over the last couple of weeks. But there's probably going to be at least one thing that's actually interesting and fun and positive, and I look forward to seeing it and talking about it with you all in real time. But until then... I'll see you all next time on that Tom Clancy show. Have a great, have a great night, everybody. And, uh, drink your water and eat your vitamins. And I'm going to go now. <laughs>